everyone, Jennifer L. Scott here and welcome to The Daily Connoisseur. Our interview series continues and our guest today is very special. We have Dr. Chloe Carmichael on the show today. She is a clinical psychologist in New York and she is the author of Nervous Energy, Harness the Power of Your Anxiety. So we're going to talk about how high functioning people can harness their anxiety and extra energies in order to live the best life possible. So I hope that you enjoy this interview. You can learn more about Dr. Chloe Carmichael at drchloe.com. And now let's jump into the interview. Welcome Dr. Chloe Carmichael to The Daily Connoisseur. It's so nice to have you here. Thank you, Jennifer and Chic Society. It's great to be with you. <laughs> yes, I, you know, I was a guest on your podcast. So we had a wonderful conversation and I got to know you better as well through that. And then I just absolutely had to buy your book. And I, you're seeing, I have a little page markers here, lavender, but I have marked this thing up. This book is so valuable to me because it spoke to me on so many different levels. And I was really surprised by that. So I have so much that I wanna ask you about, um, but congratulations on a really excellent book, first of all. Well, thank you, Jennifer. And those words coming from you really do mean a great deal to me because I've enjoyed your books very much as well. The psychology in your books is always a pleasant surprise for me. Yes, I, before we started recording, Dr. Chloe was telling me that there's a lot of psychology behind what I talk about. And that is so interesting to me because I've never taken a psychology course, but I'm fascinated with the subject. So I knew that the book would be interesting. So basically to introduce it to people, your specialty is working with high functioning people. And this is a term that I never really heard before I met you. So can you please explain what is a high functioning person? Sure, definitely. I would just start by saying, Jennifer, that probably many, many, many members of your audience are high functioning people. Yeah. So as a clinical psychologist, you know, when, when people hear that term, sometimes they assume it means like, oh, you know, a, a world-class chess player or something like that. Whereas actually what it really means in psychology terms is somebody who's able to, for example, make sure that they take care of their own food, clothing, and shelter, that they have at least a couple of meaningful relationships in life, that they can set an alarm clock and be somewhere on time. And obviously, even when it comes to taking care of your own food, clothing, and shelter, that includes people who are working within appropriate social safety nets if they've had a hard you know, time and they're working within appropriate social safety nets and they're working towards that kind of independence and taking good care of themselves and the people around them. In psychology, that actually qualifies as high functioning. That is That was very interesting to me when I read the definition in your book because I thought, oh, high functioning is like, the top of Wall Street and, you know, just these people that are very successful in life. But that actually is very comforting because what that means is that it is someone who can manage their life. It, it, this, we're not talking crazy goals, but just someone who leads a well-balanced life, it seems like. And I also thought it was quite interesting you put in there that they save for retirement. They're thinking about the future. And I thought that that was a, a really good point too. Yeah, definitely. Um, Future oriented thoughts. And then of course, again, like part of the reason I think I love and connect with the Chic Society and with your book so much is because it is that person who, you know, instead of just say covering their body with clothing, just, you know, basic right. check, yes. maybe they're going the extra thought to say, have I expressed myself with this clothing? Mm. You know, is, is this clothing really clean and fresh and pressed? Am I doing the most with what I have? That is the mark of a high functioning person. Yes. Okay. That's so interesting. I always tell people when I'm trying to help them express their true style that you have to put something on your body. So there's no extra effort there. So it's just the difference between, um, you know, your clothing, maybe your old exercise clothes that you might be wearing to a pretty dress. It's no difference. You just put the same thing on. And so I always encourage them because I think people think it's extra effort to, to look nice and, and dress well and everything, but it really 
physically isn't. <laughs> it's mm-hmm. more of a mental choice, you know? Mm-hmm. So, and even if it is your old exercise clothes, are they laundered? Are they folded? Mm, yes. You know, um, are they color coordinated? You know, believe mm-hmm. it or not, these are the types of things a psychologist might notice when we assess somebody because we're noticing how much care that person appears to put towards themselves. Yes. I have so many questions to jump into your book, but there was one anecdote and I feel it it would be really good to bring it up here because we're talking about this, but Dr. Chloe has so many anecdotes in the book, which is neat. Just, you know, um, clients she's met with and personal experiences. And there was that one where when you were younger, you went to seek a psychologist and you were in New York city and you went to see this person and immediately you were struck with Uh, how the room was messy and how the person was disheveled. And you immediately had that um, instinct that this was not right for you. And I found that to be, I was like marking that, that paragraph up because I thought that is so interesting because first impressions do matter. What we do matters professionally and otherwise. And you were immediately uh, taken by that. So can you just speak about that just a little bit? Yeah, sure, definitely. So I'll just say I'm not only a clinical psychologist myself, but I'm also um, a lifelong consumer, um, you know, of therapy. I'm a big fan of it. So as a young person decades ago in New York City, one of the first things I did when I arrived was to start shopping for a therapist just because it always helps me to have someone I can talk to. And up till that point, I'd never had the experience of rejecting a therapist. Every therapist (laughs) I'd ever met, I just always felt like they were helpful. Um, But in this case, I walked into the person's office and it was more than, you know, just um, not chic. (laughs) So this person, actually, I think now that with my training, I think this person was actually an active hoarder, because there were probably a 1000 old newspapers all over the place, right? And moreover, the, the woman herself was extremely disheveled, there were parts about her that you could just tell by looking at her, that she wasn't taking even basic care of her health. Mm -hmm. So the way that I like to think about it in layman's terms is whether it's our space or whether it's the way we present ourselves, that's an extended form of body language. So Mm -hmm. just like we all know that if you put a frown on your face and cross your arms, that it's kind of sending a signal to people in the same way, when you groom yourself and you groom your space, it is on a body language level telling people, Hey, I I care about you. And I want to make you feel comfortable. Yes, that's so true. A very important uh, thing to note, because I feel like there's many times for me, myself, (laughs) my problem is my car. And I've said this on my channel so many times, but I have four kids and the car gets so bad. I mean, someone might look in it and think, well, this person is a hoarder or this person is, (laughs) has issues taking care of herself, you know? So I think every person has an area where they struggle with that in their life somewhere. So it's good to call attention to that. And there's no shame in it. It's just about working it out and, and making it work for you, I think. Um, but okay, so let's start really getting into what your book is about, which is such a fascinating concept. And it's really about harnessing the nervous energy that you might have, anxiety, and making it work for you, which is something that I never even considered was a possibility. So we all have anxiety for different things, but I just love, I have all my notes here. Um, Rather than letting it drain your creativity, uh, I love that, and overrun your motivation, and you can make it a productive force. So tell us, I mean, obviously there's a lot, and you have to read the book really, but briefly, let's just discuss how is it possible that we can actually harness our anxiety and make it work for us? Yes, it's actually, it's something I'm so excited to share about because I know that there's a a lot of movement to, you know, destigmatize mental health issues, which is absolutely wonderful and we should do that. But I think what's also getting lost in the shuffle is that there's positive aspects to anxiety. A lot of people now think if they even have any kind of anxiety, they think, oh, you know, maybe, maybe that there's something wrong with me and they don't realize 
that there is a healthy function to anxiety, which is to stimulate preparation behaviors. A person without any anxiety wouldn't even think to look both ways before they cross the street. So yes. I like to think of anxiety as this kind of healthy little tickle from mother nature that is stimulating a healthy awareness that maybe there's something in our present or in our future that we're not quite prepared for, that we're not quite satisfied with. And then it actually gives us a little adrenaline and it also actually narrows our focus. Even our visual field gets a little bit more narrow under anxiety. The good news is, is that if we know how to point that focus in the right direction, mm -hmm. it can become a laser beam focus, helping us to do whatever it is that we need to do. That is so comforting. And I just wrote down, it's there for a reason. It's not an accident that we have it. I mean, and so I love that you really thought outside the box there and said, we can harness this and make it work for us. I mean, that's just genius. Um, well, so thank course, you, but I, I have to give credit where it's due. I didn't really honestly think of this myself. It's just a fact that there is right. a healthy function to anxiety, yeah. but I did notice it wasn't being talked about as much as I think it should be. Yes. And that's what I mean is that you, you were able to collect this and put it in the book. And also, so Dr. Chloe's book, the first half deals with this and the second half actually gives practical tips, things you can actually do to harness your anxiety. So We're going to talk about a few of those in a moment. Um, but uh, let's see, I just want to consult my notes here to make sure I'm not missing anything. See, your own nervous energy is what, what propelled you to make all these notes and all these questions, yes. right? Yes. So and it's a beautiful thing. Yes. And so talking about me, because I think the people who watch the channel, they know me pretty well from doing YouTube for so long. But the reason why I really related to a lot of this is because I am, I, okay, I have nervous anxiety for certain things, but I don't let it, I don't let it ruin my life or run my life. And I certainly don't think anxiety is a problem for me, but what I do find is that I am so hyper-focused with work that I have trouble relaxing. So, and I know that you have a lot of clients that deal with that. I was, uh, you know, reading about your client, you have a high profile client on wall street who, is just a shark with her work and just makes, you know, such an incredible living and she's so successful, but then in her personal life that she has that same attitude when she's dating men and it doesn't work for her um, because she expects them to do all these things and she like, she commands them to do them. So I was laughing at that part because I thought, I feel like for me, <clears throat> I'm really good with work and productivity and efficiency. And, but that is a detrimental thing for me when I'm trying to rest because I can't rest. <laughs> mm -hmm. So what advice do you have for someone like me? And I think that there's a lot of people out there who can relate to this, especially moms. Yeah, definitely. I think that's such an important question. So when you know that sometimes we can almost just get into a little bit of overdrive and even what is just sometimes a cognitive habit of sticking on the things that are on our to-do list. And sometimes I'm not saying this is the case with you, but for some people, they can almost even get addicted to the productivity hit. That and then me. it be, yeah. And so, and <laughs> well, I, I've been there personally myself as well. And so sometimes things that can be helpful, a couple of techniques from the book that come to mind. One is called thought replacement. Yes. So when you mm -hmm. find yourself, you know, just mentally starting to go into these scripts about what should I be doing, et cetera. Mm -hmm you can repeat to yourself, you can just take control of that internal monologue and say to yourself, the most productive thing I can do right now is relax. The most productive thing I can do right now yes. is relax. And to just really focus yourself on that, to start to underline to yourself that that actually is part of, of a productive thing to do. Another thing that can be helpful is a technique from the book called the mental shortlist. So mm -hmm. what we do with the mental shortlist is it's really handy when we know that we have a tendency to keep pivoting onto 
either a certain specific topic or a certain specific area of life and almost overdo it in that area sometimes. So if, if a person knows that their overdo it area is their productivity list, then they would create a mental short list of five things that are really good relaxation unwinding activities like you know, check in with my list of friends and family that I keep meaning to call or, you know, Mm -hmm. browse new restaurants that I would enjoy Mm -hmm. or, you know, lie down and take a nap for 20 minutes, whatever it is. But the idea is that you have five good items on that list because as I mentioned earlier, when we get that kind of zing from anxiety, our vision gets narrow and it can actually be hard to recall the five good ways that we could relax. Plus it's almost like yelling at a person to relax never works, right? Like, (laughs) Hey, relax, just stop thinking, calm down and relax. That never really works. But if we, if we offer ourselves five good ideas, it's a lot easier to pivot onto those things. Yes. And that's so funny because those two were my favorite from your techniques, along with the three-part breath. Hmm. But yes, because I, that is so powerful for me to give myself permission to relax basically, which I feel like I, I don't do. And, and you're right. Relaxing is equally as important. Dr. Chloe, you're blurry for some reason. I know. Um, I just, oh, there I go. Oh, there you are. Okay. Okay. It was strange. (laughs) That was funny. Um, So yes, I love that giving yourself permission to, to relax and that it's equally important. And there is an antidote in the book and I loved this. I absolutely love this. But when you were studying for your dissertation, you had, it was a very stressful time because you had to, I mean, I can't even imagine how stressful it would be to create a dissertation, but you would go to the Carlisle hotel and treat yourself (laughs) (laughs) to food and a nice drink and the beautiful atmosphere. And it did um, you know, cost a lot and you didn't have the biggest budget back then, but that was important for you to surround yourself in that environment in order to do your best work. And I love that because it's almost like you're, we, we always feel like we need to punish ourselves for things. I think, especially women, especially moms. And so for me, giving myself the permission to relax is like a huge luxury for me. It's like the equivalent of the Carlisle hotel. (laughs) Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know? Mm-hmm. And so when you wrote that, that spoke to me so much too. And I completely related to that. Thanks. Yeah. You know, what's interesting about that too, is that self-discipline is actually a finite resource, right? Mm-hmm. So I know a lot of your audience, the Chic Society, they are somewhat disciplined people, right? I mean, I think Madame Chic would agree that, you know, it, it takes a certain amount of self-discipline to maintain the level and the standards, you know, that you're setting for yourself, even though it's out of kindness to yourself that you're setting those standards, but it still does take effort and discipline to do it. So Mm -hmm. um, the idea that I was doing there is that I was saying, okay, I've really got to buckle down and, you know, discipline myself to write this dissertation. So I'm going to almost borrow and loosen up on the self-discipline from some other area of life, which at the time was my shoestring budget. And I said, you know, at least I'll go to a nice restaurant and I'll, you know, work on this. So for members in your audience that are thinking about that for themselves, you know, like, okay, I, I want to be more disciplined in the way that I put together my home or, you know, put mm-hmm. together my myself or, you know, those types of things to be able to think, well, where could I give myself a little bit of wiggle room on the other side? Like maybe uh, I'll let myself sleep in for an extra 15 minutes right. and just enjoy my beautiful bedroom that I've made, you know, so chic and serene. Mm-hmm. Yes. It's those little treats that get us through life. We need them. Um, I was talking about this very same thing with another author I interviewed, um, Brian Kozlowski, who wrote Long Live the Queen. Same thing. And it's really rewarding yourself. And it's these little things that get us through the day. And in At Home with Madame Chic, I talk about the pleasures of the morning, the pleasures of the afternoon, and the pleasures of the evening. And it is important to focus on those um, because I, I just think we're all too hard on ourselves, you know? So I really love that you that you did that. Um, I wanted to close with talking about the three-part breath 
because you used to be a yoga instructor, which I find really interesting. And I think breath is so powerful because I notice myself that throughout the day, if I am stressed, that there's a, a massive tightness in my stomach area, just it feels like a ball of anxiety. And so when I do the three-part breath and Dr. Chloe um, explains it beautifully in the book, so I'm sure we can't go into every detail, but it is so healing. I literally feel the tension in my belly gut area just dissolving. And it's like an instant physical thing you can do to, to transmute that anxiety. So can you tell us how did you discover the three-part breath and what are its benefits? Absolutely. And I will also say that at drchloe.com slash breathe or nervousenergybook.com, people can get a free video of mm. me, you know, walking them through that breath. And Jennifer, I would also love to invite you since you do have the book and you know about the cocoon breath, you could also do the cocoon um, breath with an exhale around that stress ball in your stomach. Oh, and I just yes. think it would be really beautiful. Okay. But to answer your question, it. To answer your question, I, I actually did learn that, as you said, as a yoga teacher, and it, it was a mindfulness exercise. But what's so interesting is that studies have shown that by learning to observe and describe something like our breath, we actually sharpen our skills at being able to observe and notice our thoughts and feelings, which mm -hmm. actually really does help to reduce anxiety because the better we can know ourselves and communicate with other people, the more we can have social support and be close with others. Plus on the obvious level, taking nice deep breaths and taking that time to pay attention to yourself is also, of course, very good for you on a stress level. So it's um, good for you on multiple fronts. I love that. It all comes down to mindfulness, which is something that you discuss in the book as well. So the, the breath, the noticing of the breath brings you um, to your thoughts and our thoughts. And I'm learning so much as I, I just love, I love getting older <laughs> because I feel like I'm just learning so much lately. And ever since I hit 40, I've really been researching a lot of this and it's been helping me tremendously, but just the power of our thoughts. And that's why I loved your thought replacement so much. I'm a big fan of affirmations. And, um, you know, in the, I do the chic assignment each month where we try to improve ourselves. And for the past, for this year, we've been focusing on gratitude, but also I have a technique where I, when I have a negative thought, I try to interrupt it and not finish it and replace it with a positive affirmation. And it's really holding your thoughts captive and, being in control of them and realizing that they don't control you. That is such an empowering thing. So um, that's like your whole book is, is really helping people to do this. And it's, it's so practical. So I just wanted to say thank you so much, not only for writing the book, but just you're such a important part of the Daily Connoisseur community as well. So we just, I, I just adore you. And, and I wanna thank you for, um, for being here on the channel. Well, thank you so much, Jennifer. The pleasure is mine. And if you don't mind, there's one more quick tip I would love to yes, share please. with your audience, because I know that your audience is on a quest to improve themselves and their lives, which is so wonderful. And I'm right there with them. I'm a part of that community. Mm -hmm. At the same time, I know that one of the challenges can be perfectionism, right? Mm, and yes. so there is a whole section in the book on perfectionism, but I just want to share with your community what I think could be a helpful perspective on it, which mm -hmm. is that when we have something about ourselves that we're trying to improve or grow or change, and we notice ourselves in some way kind of slipping or not quite meeting the mark, what I suggest is to actually congratulate yourself on noticing that because if yes. you think about it it's much better to notice the issue than to not notice it right awareness is better than non-awareness and when we set the stage with a warm compassionate start of saying wow congratulations i'm so glad i noticed that and now what can i do to try to support myself better next time in that mm -hmm. goal it actually helps to make us more willing to notice and grapple with areas of growth. So I just wanted to share that one final tip. I love that. That's so important. And 
You know, um, that's really funny that you say that because in my journaling this morning, I wrote something <clears throat> very similar. And, you know, I did, I did love that in your book, but also I feel, I have this thing where I feel like what I do is not effective. I don't know why I tell myself this. Like, it doesn't matter what it is. If it's something small or something big, and I think it's not effective, I have to redo things. And so even today I thought, no, I just need, that's just a lie that I'm believing, you know, and what I do is effective. And so it, this is like the same, in the same vein here, but I love that to congratulate yourself because awareness is the first step always, mm -hmm. the consciousness of the thing. So that's great. Yeah. And Jennifer, let me say you are effective because oh. <laughs> I, I, you've been such an enhancement to my own days. So thank you for everything that you do share. Oh, thank you. I feel so blessed to be your friend and, and to know you. So thank you so much, Dr. Chloe. You can find her at drchloe.com. And I will leave all of her resources, social medias linked down below. And thank you so much for joining us on The Daily Connoisseur. I hope you'll come back one day. Thanks, Jennifer. I hope you enjoyed my interview with Dr. Chloe Carmichael. I will leave her book linked down below. It's called Nervous Energy. And you can also learn more about Dr. Chloe at drchloe.com. Thank you for joining us here on The Daily Connoisseur. Keep calm and remain classy. And I will see you in my next video. Goodbye. Thank you.